So if you'd like to get your Bibles out, we're going to Genesis chapter 6 to start with. Genesis chapter 6. In verse 13, so this is just a little bit here of the story of uh, Noah. We're not particularly looking at Noah today, but anyhow. Genesis 6 verse 13 says, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with uh, the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood, rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Uh, and this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. So it's a pretty large um, vessel, um, very big in fact. And um, they're told to uh, pitch it within and without. Now, this word pitch here has got nothing to do with baseball. Uh, it's not that kind of pitch. Um, in the Hebrew, the word here for pitch is um, kofa, K-O-F-E-R, and it means a covering. Um, can also mean, uh, mean a bitumen as in what we would put on roads, but it also has another meaning, which means a redemption price. So something bought with a, uh, with, with a price there, a redemption price. And it's, um, it's black, um, it's real sort of sticky, um, and it's left behind when coal tar is heated or, or, or distilled. Um, Pitch belongs in the same family as asphalt, which we know. This whole thing out here, this car park here, has got asphalt all over it, uh, or bitumen it's on the roads. If you've ever been behind one of those trucks where they've been laying a new part of the road, you see that sort of black, sticky, hot stuff coming out the back there. Um, these days, it's mainly produced uh, from coal, heating, heating of coal, um, and most. Um, people these days um, really don't know of any other source for it. It's really that's that's where we get it um, from. Um, <clears throat> so the question is, how was Noah meant to do this in the pre-petroleum um, coal oil industry um, days? What was sort of what was he going to do? Well, um, uh, in the old days, very old days. Uh, they got it from pine trees, a resin from pine trees, and it grew in forests um, pretty much throughout uh, Europe. And they would sort of cut sort of marks into it, in a bit of a herringbone pattern. Um, and the resin from the tree would sort of run down and they would, they would gather it in a pot of some sort at the bottom of the, of the tree. Um, some places in Europe still uh, use the same technique, Poland, um, you know, Russia, Finland, those sorts of um, countries still sort of do it that way where there's lots of pine forests. Um, when, the, when the resin had sort of finished coming out of the tree, they would chop it down. Um, they covered it in soil um, and then uh, they, they would burn it real slow to produce a... Um, sort of a very pure form of carbon, which we call charcoal, sort of where they would get charcoal from. Um, and then the last step in the process of making this pitch was to add powdered charcoal to the pine resin, which was boiling. So they were heating it up. They would mix that together. And different proportions between the charcoal and the pine resin would give um, different properties, depending on what they wanted to um, use use it for and it was that method that pitch which was used to water uh, waterproof uh, wooden ships ocean going ships and so it's very possible that highly likely in fact that this is how noah 
octane pitch uh, from uh, for for the arc, the, the pitch that it's talking about here. And so um, this oil, um, either from coal or from trees, wherever you're getting it from, it was used as a covering. It was used as a protection between you uh, and the the, the outside uh, elements. And so it was used as a separation, if you like, between the eight people that were um, on the ark, and I guess the ark itself in some in, in protecting it, and the chaos that was about to happen with the flood. And we sort of know all about we sort of know all about that. And so God caused there to be a a, a separation uh, with this oil, with this with this um, pitch. Um, really marking between those who would be obedient to him and everyone else, those who, who weren't obedient um, to him. And so I'm sure you can see where I'm going with all of that, that the Holy Ghost is our separation, our differentiation, if you like, between the world and God's people. That there's a difference between uh, between us and and the people of this world, not because we're better or smarter or or anything, um, but it's because of the separation that God has given to us through that um, through that spirit there. So Noah, when he's on this ark here, is obviously in the world. He's on a boat. He's on the he's in water, sort of thing. So he's obviously in the world, but we would say he wasn't of the world because of this separation that the oil provided um, to him um, uh, as we are in the world, the Bible says, but not of it, uh, by reason of the oil, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit um, that was poured out from Jesus who was nailed to a tree. They got their pitch from cutting a tree and collecting it and all that sort of thing. Well, our, our separating oil was given by Jesus who was nailed to a tree. I said before that word pitch there can also mean a redemption price. Well, Jesus, of course, paid our price. We should have paid, but really had no chance, of course, of doing it. But Jesus paid that price for us. Now, if you go over to the book of um, Leviticus, chapter 8, Leviticus, chapter 8. So um, here the Lord is talking to Moses and um, getting him to get Aaron and Aaron's sons and get them to sort of, you know, come together there. In verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering, and two rams, and a basket of unleavened bread. And gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water and put upon him the coat and girded him with the girdle and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod upon him. And he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith. There's a whole bunch of talks in that verse on alone. And he put the breastplate upon him, and uh, uh, also he put in the breastplate, breastplate, the Urim and the Thummim. Again, there's an entire talk just in those two words. And he put the mitre upon his head, uh, also upon the mitre, even upon his forefront. Did he put the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses? And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein, and sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times, and anointed the altar and all his vessels 
both the laver and his foot to sanctify them. And he poured uh, of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. <coughs> and Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon them as the Lord commanded um, Moses. And so you get this oil coming uh, uh, to the forefront again. Here the word oil in Hebrew is um, shemen. And it literally means uh, lots of things. It could mean grease. It could mean uh, a liquid oil. Uh, very typically, olive oil is what is what it would have been. Uh, quite often, it was um, perfumed, um, make it smell nice. Um, it can also mean richness, and it can also mean to be fruitful. And so you read what was happening to Aaron. Uh, and his sons here that they were that they were washed that's the first thing that happened that they were washed that they were clothed in special clothing well we've been washed we've been washed with the re regeneration of the holy spirit that we've been clothed now with white robes of righteousness um the next thing they did was that they uh, anointed god's dwelling place and they went through the tabernacle there and the labor and all this sort of thing. And they, they're anointing though the things that were in God's uh, uh, dwelling place. And so um, you think of all of those things that would have been there. His word, his provision, the manna that was there, Aaron's rod that budded, all of those things. Life from something that had no life. And, and that's where we've come from. We've been given life from a position where we had no life. Sure, we were breathing. Sure, we were doing all the things of, uh, of this natural life. But as far as the Lord was concerned, we were dead in our, uh, in our trespasses and sins there. And so he pours this anointing oil on Aaron's head to, to sanctify him, to purify him, to uh, proclaim him, to prepare him, to separate him, all of those, uh, all of those things. And so now... Um, Aaron and his sons are set apart and they're empowered to perform uh, what the Lord wants them to do. They've now, got, they've now got authority from the Lord to be priests in the Old Testament sense. Well, they couldn't have just done that themselves. They didn't sort of lobby for the job, did they? John was talking this afternoon that God chooses us. And he chose them for this anointing, for this separation, as he's chosen you and I for the same thing in a different way, certainly. But uh, we've been set apart. We've been empowered now to perform our duties, our vocation, as the Bible, um, as the Bible puts it. And so from here, they, they go on and do the things that... Um, you know, the Lord wants them to do, Aaron, certainly, anyway. Um, sacrifices were made for atonement. Um, lots of them, different, you know, animals. And they had to be atoned themselves and, uh, and, the, and the people. And so by this anointing oil that was poured over Aaron, it was a way of, of, of cleansing uh, the people for an atonement. And there's lots of things about that atonement. Again, another talk, even in itself. And so, and so this process had now begun where there was going to be this separation by the oil. There was going to be anointing by the oil. There was empowerment. How? By the oil. And uh, all of those things started at this, uh, at this particular time. Now, if you go to the next chapter, which is Leviticus 9, and verse 22, just a couple of verses there. And so, you know, at this point, you know, they're doing a whole, a whole lot of things and sacrificing and uh, at the altar and a whole range of things. And in Leviticus 9.22, it says, And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of the congregation and came out 
and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And then came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. I guess the thing from that is when you do things correctly, when you do things according to the instructions that that you're given in the word of God, then the glory of God is manifest. He's, he really wants to display his power and his goodness and his grace unto, unto his people. And so they get, to this, they get to this end of this chapter here, this story. They must have been like firing on all cylinders, you would think. There would have been incredible rejoicing in Israel at this particular time that They've, they've got these people that they've been set apart. The Lord is with them. And, uh, and then the fire came out. And uh, the fire fell, as we sang this afternoon, uh, consumed the burnt offering. And when everybody saw it, there was great joy, rejoicing. They shouted and they fell on their faces and they, they worshipped the Lord there. Praise the Lord. Next chapter. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Unfortunately, uh, it didn't take very long for someone to come up with an alternative, for someone to think, well, I've, we've got these instructions and we know this is what we're meant to do, but I've had a bit of a, an aha moment here. And I, I think I can improve upon the situation. I think I can do something that maybe the people will like better or I feel more comfortable with or maybe more popular or whatever it was. But they did something which the Lord commanded them uh, commanded them not. Maybe they thought they knew better than God did. A lot of people do, unfortunately. Anyway, in verse 2, and there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they, did, and they died uh, uh, before the Lord. You would have thought that would have got people's attention, wouldn't you? Thinking, gosh, here's Aaron's sons. Um, they go out doing the wrong thing and, you know, they're they're gone. They're de uh, devoured by the fire. Last time the fire was, um, you know, like an accepting thing, like here's my power. This time it was the same thing, but uh, not good for them. Verse 3, and Moses said to Aaron, uh, this, is that, this is it that the Lord spoke, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people I will, uh, I will be glorified. And Aaron uh, held his peace. And Moses called Mishael and Elzaphan, the sons of Zeal, the uncle of Aaron, and said unto them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them in their coats out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and unto uh, Eleazar and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die. And lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord has kindled. And you shall not go out from the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moses. And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. Uh, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, and that you may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. When God anoints, um, it's always a very special thing that's done. Um, John was talking today about, you know, people remembering the exact moment, um, the time and the date when the anointing happened. Uh, to them and maybe not everybody remembers it but probably quite a few people uh, do and 
And we're, we're given that event, which we all remember, something that we're, I guess, expected to, to value um, with our life. It's a very much a before and after moment, isn't it? There was a moment in time where we didn't know the Lord at all, despite what we might have thought about ourselves. And then one moment later, we had a relationship with God because the infilling of the oil, the anointing of the Holy Spirit came, uh, came into our life. But God, of course, is, is an exacting God. You know, don't mess with my instructions is what, he, is what he says. Verse 7 there, it says, And you shall not go out from the door of the congregation, uh, of the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die, for the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. Once you're anointed, don't seek to leave the sanctuary. You're anointed now, the Lord said. I don't want you to go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I want you to stay where I put you. And that's what, that's what we've been given, instruction, that once we're anointed with the Holy Ghost, that we don't want to go back into the world. We don't want to experience the things that are happening out there. We, we've got to go to work, we've got to go to school, we've got to go to the store, we've got to do a whole range of things out there, and everybody understands that. But we're in it, but we're not of it. We're not part of that system, we're not part of that lifestyle, we're not part of anything that they, that they do, because we've been separated. But it says in verse 10, what, why are we doing this? That you may put a difference between holy and unholy between unclean and clean, between righteousness and unrighteousness, between having an, an actual relationship with God through the Holy Spirit and making a decision for Christ or some other nonsense that people say. There's so much of a difference there. We, we don't want to compromise and do the things that they do or the things that they say because the Lord has given us instruction. And uh, hallelujah, that we've been anointed. Not the, exactly the same way that Aaron has, of course, but the same principle is, uh, is what we've been called to. Praise the Lord. All right, uh, Hebrews, if you would, uh, chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Uh, verse 11. So chapter 7 uh, talks a bit about um, Melchizedek, um, which is sort of a mysterious bit of a character there in the Old Testament. Um, if you want to know everything about Melchizedek, talk to Chris later, and he will explain it all to you in uh, fine detail. Is that right? Um, so, so it's talking about this Melchizedek, but we're going to pick it up in verse 11, Hebrews 7, verse 11. It says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood through Aaron, for under, under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called, uh, um, called after the order of Aaron? There had to be a new priesthood raised up, not not just through the lineage of um, uh, Aaron there, had to be something different. This one wasn't through Aaron. This is through this Melchizedek. Um, for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So because the law sort of came through, you know, Aaron and that whole event, now there's a different priesthood now there's something different coming. Verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which uh, no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, 
there arises another priest, talking about Jesus, who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless uh, endless life. But he testifies, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's, again, there's not a whole range of talks just in that. But what he's getting at is there was Aaron and there was the law given and the anointing of Aaron and all those things, but there had to be a change. There had to be a new priesthood, a new way, a new hope. Jesus, as it says there, came out of Judah, which was never mentioned as far as being the priesthood, not ever mentioned. It was always Levi was the priestly, uh, the priestly tribe there. Um, and so Jesus couldn't come out of Levi because a complete change had to be uh, evident and given. And so it wasn't a priest, priesthood by lineage, but a new and living way, as the Bible as the Bible says, um, we know that in Luke chapter four, when Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he goes on to say what he was going to do, but he'd been in the, in the wilderness there. He'd been tempted of the devil. The Holy spirit had come and he comes back to Nazareth. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so at this point, Jesus is anointed as our great high priest. Not going to be another change. There's been one change and that's it. Jesus, Jesus is the way, he, he's it now. Um, unlike the Old Testament, where the priests would make sacrifices of animals for um, atonement, not only of their own sins, but of the, of the nation, so that's what they were doing, our great high priest does the opposite of that. He sacrifices himself in order that we would have atonement for ourselves. But he would pay. He would pay the price there. Um, Jesus offered himself because he was the only acceptable sacrifice because he did no sin. The high priest he had to make sacrifice for himself as well for his own atonement. But Jesus, of course, um, he offered himself not for himself, but for um, but for you and I. So if you go to the next chapter, <clears throat> Hebrews eight. Verse 1 says, now the things which we have spoken, this is the Son. I guess that's a good way to put it. We have such a high priest who was set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Wow, that's a, another bad way to be described. Jesus Christ, of course, the high priest set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man when when moses oh, sorry when noah was pitching within and pitching without as the song goes in don't not noah he was putting this on the the ark physically to make a separation for protection keep it waterproof was really the idea but it was a ceiling uh it was a differentiation between those on the inside and those on the on the outside and he, he, he probably did it with the the, uh, the pine resin and the chart he probably did it all that way but in this case it's it's different this is a true tabernacle which the lord pitched the lord made the difference the lord set it apart the lord gave the protection as it were Verse 3, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve uh, unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, says he, that you make it all uh, that they'll make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Moses was told by God, I'm going to tell you how to build it, and I want you to build it um, uh, exactly. It has to, be, has to be exact. The old high priest offered sacrifices of animals and things. Jesus had to offer something different. It couldn't be the same. 
it was a different priesthood uh, uh, altogether. In verse six, but now has but now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he's the, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. The old covenant, the old testament, was perfect in every way. There's nothing at all wrong with the law. There's nothing wrong with any of it. What was wrong was us. That's what was wrong. That we were not perfect. That we couldn't live. Uh, that we couldn't live up to it. There was nothing wrong with the law. It was just that we couldn't obey it. We just couldn't do it. Now there's this uh, this new covenant where the laws aren't on tablets of stone and go, well, there's the law over there. Let's read it. It's different now. It's a different priesthood altogether. Those, those laws are written on our hearts so that we, we can't forget that they're part of us. When we receive the Holy Spirit, those laws are, are part of our being, not just something we think, well, that's nice over there um, sort of thing. Uh, where do I get to? Uh, uh, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them uh, not, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be uh, to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. There's going to be a relationship which is more than just schoolmaster and student. This is friendship. This is relationship. This is something that's personal this is something where we've been grafted now into into the tree uh, don't turn to this but in hebrews 4 it says seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our profession for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points <clears throat> tempted like as we are yet without sin let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. People might have sort of gone to Aaron and the other high priests and uh, thought, well, they don't understand what I'm going through or they don't know this or he's just a man or whatever. Well, our new great high priest can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He's been through more than any of us undoubtedly ever will. Suffered more than undoubtedly we ever will in our, in our life, in our lifetimes, you know. He was tempted, as we all are. <clears throat> we we uh, uh, can fall to those temptations or the bright lights or whatever it might be, but not, but not Jesus. He's perfect in every way. And so we can, we can come to him. We can go boldly to him because we understand that perfection. We understand that the priesthood has changed. It's not just a lineage of men. But this was a complete change to the whole process of how this would, of how this would work. And so we can come boldly. We can obtain mercy. We can find grace because he's perfect in every way. Let's finish in uh, Matthew 25, if you would, we just finish there. Matthew 25. We know this story <clears throat> well. This is Jesus speaking. Verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil 
in their vessels with their lamps. And while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go you rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. We know, of course, that the Holy Spirit is likened unto an oil. Well, unfortunately, five of these uh, people here, they had an oil leak. And if you've ever seen an actual oil leak, a uh, crude oil leak, they, they, they're disastrous in every way. There's not one good thing uh, about an oil leak. Um, they can change a pristine coastline into um, you know, an environmental disaster in, in no time at all. And it often happens due to carelessness or a lack of maintenance. Um, the one that happened back in 2010 that I was in, well, kind of involved in, not that I was involved in anyway, uh, that's what happened. They had old, unmaintained, properly, uh, equipment and a gazillion gallons of oil were released into the to the Gulf. And so the very last thing that we want in our life is an oil leak. I'm not talking about your car. I'm talking about your walk in the Lord because it leads to things that are not good, spiritual disaster. And that can happen for the same reasons, carelessness or a lack of pop, proper regular maintenance and we all know what that maintenance is we know what we have to do um, as john was saying today action um we've got to act upon these things all 10 of these people had lamps with oil uh, in it but some of them didn't recognize they had an oil leak and then they look and they think, uh-oh, our lamps are going out. What do we do now? Can I get some of yours? No, you've got to go and get your own. We work out our own salvation, don't we, with fear and trembling. Yes, there are brothers and sisters to help. Yes, we can pray unto the Lord, all of those things. But ultimately, the action part of it is up to each uh, individual. Aaron was appointed by God to be the high priest. Jesus was appointed by God to be a high priest forever. This is the difference. Aaron has come and gone. Uh, Jesus, not so. Um, as Noah was separated, as Aaron also was in that sense as being a high priest, so have we been anointed with the separating oil of the Holy Spirit, that we have this relationship now that is so special and so precious unto us that we're not going to go out of the tabernacle. We're not going to walk out of the tabernacle because we want to be, we want to be in the midst of it all where the relationship is. We've got to value it, that relationship that we have with our great high priest, to be diligent and watchful. What did he say there? Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. If you knew that the law was coming back at five o'clock this afternoon, what would you do? I bet you wouldn't go to the Publix <laughs> or something, whatever it might be. Um, you know, I bet we'd all be on our knees if we knew, but we don't because the law wants to find out what we made of. What would you do? Even if you don't know, you know it's coming. What will you do? <clears throat> One last verse, just a quote, Luke chapter 10. And Jesus speaking, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, 
and took care of him. Part of the parable there. The Lord poured in oil and wine, gave us that spirit and set him on his own beast. I'll carry you. I'll look after you. I'll be there for you. Brought him to an inn, took him to a sanctuary, took him to a place with shelter, with, with food, no doubt, which is where we are, a place with food and nourishment, spiritual nourishment, and took care of him. Who's going to take care of us more than Jesus Christ, our great high priest? Nobody. Nobody will take care of you more or better than he ever will. Value that relationship. Know that we've been anointed. Praise the Lord. Stick with it. The Lord's coming back. All the people said. Amen. Amen.